forecast here. It's very reassuring, Secretary of State. Um, just quickly on the topic of education improvement areas, um, Ipswich was an opportunity area. Um, we're also going to be one of these priority improvement. I'm just trying to understand more fully how these are going to work. Is it going to be sort of similar to the opportunity area, like an extension of that? What are the differences going to be between opportunity areas and improvement areas? Yeah, really good question, Tom. So um, I was a big advocate of the Opportunity Area Programme because I was the Children's Families Minister and my team, um, when I got the job, showed me this, this, this project. Um, and the great thing about it was about uh, local engagement. It was, it's sort of ground up, you know, identifying good, strong local leadership, not just political, business leadership as well, um, working on a um, you know, focused uh, project to improve education in uh, Ipswich, in uh, Hastings, in Doncaster and elsewhere around the country. And what I didn't want to do is lose all that great work that we've done. So I, I pitched it to Michael Gove to say, look, look at this incredible work that we've done in the department. How can we build on that? So what we're doing is taking the best of the evidence of what worked in the opportunity areas and embedding it in the Educational Investment Areas Plus. Um, that's, that's essentially what we're going to do. Much greater, obviously, focus on what worked in educational attainment. Brilliant. Um, in terms of, um, you, you know my views on special educational needs. In terms of the um, dyslexia, uh, um, um, Matt Hancock's dyslexia um, bill, um, I understand that, you know, that I'm having, I've, I've discussed it with lots of different uh, individuals in the sector, and I know that some people have got some concerns about the details in the bill. But I'm keen, though, that we find a way of achieving the aims of the bill, if that means that some of the details need to be refined. And I'm, I'm sure there's a way of the department coming together with him to, to, to find a way of doing this. Because I know some people have said, oh, we don't want to label uh, uh, young people as having dyslexia and dyspraxia or something like that. When, when they don't have it. But trust me, as somebody who is dyslexic and distracted, some people do have it. Uh, and, and actually, it was only when I was 12 when I found out I had it that things went right for me. Yeah. And I went from being uh, a 12-year-old with a reading really writing age of an 8-year-old to actually ended up doing pretty well academically. So um, I know there's issues of cost, um, so, but I just would urge you to, because it, there might be a few issues with the um, bill as it stands, not to say, oh, well, we can't do anything and to, to work with them constructively to find a way to do something in that space, because I'm sure that would be the best outcome for young people. So, one, you make a very powerful point on, on this, and um, one of the things that I think is going to uh, be a real game-changer on this is the parent pledge mm -hmm. in the school's white paper. Why do I say that? Because, actually, what we're pledging um, uh, through schools, through teachers, is to identify the gaps in um, English, in the ability to read, um, write, um, uh, uh, and speak uh, mm. the language, um, and then share that with the parents. Mm. Now, because that's a pledge we're making, um, uh, that you know, really high-quality teachers, um, family schools already deliver, I want to deliver everywhere. Mm. Uh, part of that pledge will mean that teachers will be able to very quickly want tools to identify if a child is uh, dyslexic or dyspraxic. Uh, and so I think there's a, there's a real opportunity for us through the white paper to do this and do it well. Brilliant. On the, um, uh, the, the uh, green paper, the send, uh, green paper, which I think was a good, good document, I think I'm pleased there's going to be a consultation period. Um, there was a lot in there about um, new SEND specialists, and SEND, which I think is part of it, and that's good. New education psychologists, good. Yeah. Um, but I also think it's important, though, that we focus on ensuring that all teachers who aren't specialists have got a base level of understanding in SEND, because I still hear many teachers saying that when they, they've got their teacher training, they, ha they heard very little about SEND. So I think it's about ensuring that every teacher, specialist or not, has a certain level of understanding so they can pick up and actually frankly general appreciation that you know not all of our brains work in the same way yep. and actually not all young people process information in the same way and, and, and just having that kind of at the back of their mind whenever they're teaching. I, and I, I agree with you which is why the focus on, on that sort of um, support for a, um, a, a SENCO in schools um, is so important as part of the yep. green paper um, but also 
in post-16 education. You know, I'm passionate about this because um, when I visit some of the you know, really great um, work, whether in mainstream or specialist schools, um, I went to a brilliant school in, again, I think it was Blackpool High Furlough. Um, uh, it, 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 these kids do tremendously well, uh, but actually we want to do well post-16 as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we've got uh, training bursaries of 15,000 each tax-free for FE sector to, to, to specialise in SEND mm -hmm. um, as well. Um, so a lot of work's being done on and, this. And, and I'd just add, uh, because to, to absolutely to your point about all um, uh, teachers uh, need that foundation, uh, that's why the, the thread of the core content that goes in, on, in the, in the fundamental changes to the quality of, inter of initial teacher training and the early careers um, uh, framework mm -hmm. has, has as one of its central points how children learn. Fantastic. I'm just, just